We're back with question 20 on the 2020 VCAR chemistry exam. Consider the following changes that would be applied to the operating parameters of a chromatogram sent to carry out high performance liquid chromatography on HPLC with a polar stationary phase and a non-polar mobile phase. Which of these changes would most likely reduce the retention time of a sugar, which is polar, in the HPLC? So, decreasing the viscosity of the mobile phase. If we decrease the viscosity, it would flow better. So therefore it's gonna go through quicker, which would reduce the retention time. So that is true. Using a more tightly packed stationary phase. If we tightly pack the stationary phase, it's gonna be harder to go through it. So therefore that's gonna actually increase the time it spends in the column. So that's not gonna be true. Using a mobile phase that is more polar than the stationary phase. All right, so if a mobile phase that is more polar our polar sugar should be attracted to our mobile phase so it would move through our chromatogram quicker. So that is true. So the answer here is going to be uh, B. Question answered. Question 21, and this is an infrared spectroscopy question. And I love these because they're relatively straightforward most of the time. Anyway, looking at this, I can see that I've got a C double bonded to O here because that's sitting around about 1700. That's a um, carbonyl... Um, Carbonyl? Anyway, C double bond to O bond anyway. And this guy over here is most likely going to be an O to H or an N to H. I see I've got like two little um, fangs here. So that's why I'm saying N to H because it's going to be an N to H2 is more likely. Anyway, regardless, which of these molecules uh, refer to the IR spectrum, the compound could be what? All right, this here is an ester. All right, it does not have uh, one of these bonds, so it can't be A, so it's not gonna be that because we don't have an O to H or we haven't got a amine group. This guy here is an aldehyde. Again, it doesn't have the OH, so it's not gonna be that, okay, because this functional group here looks like this. This functional group here looks like this. So therefore we don't have um, this thing here happening. This guy here, I've got an amine off this side, and I've got a, what looks like an amide, so it's gonna be like this happening. That's looking pretty good for it, okay? Because we have both this and that. Now, what's the last one? Our last molecule has got an NH2 and an OH, which means it doesn't have this um, C double bond to O, so it's not gonna be that one. It's gonna be C, based on the information here. As soon as you see infrared, you should start annotating what it could be in there. And you should also have a good familiarization of the general shapes for various peaks in IR spectroscopy. Question 22. The combustion of which fuel provides the most energy per 100 grams? Or if it's per 100 grams, it's the same as per gram. So let's have a look at what we've got to here. Uh, pentane, which releases this many megajoules per ton. How do I get from per ton to per gram? I divide by what a ton actually is. So I go 49097 divided by what a ton actually is, which is 10 to the power of 6, gives me 0 0.049 uh, megajoules per gram. Now this one here is kilojoules per gram, so let's get that into kilojoules as well. So times it by 1,000 to get to kilojoules gives me 49 kilojoules per gram by the looks of it. That doesn't sound about right. I reckon I'm out by a factor of 10 there. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, butanol is this many kilojoules per mole. To get from kilojoules per mole to kilojoules per gram, I'm gonna divide by my molar mass. So I'm gonna take my uh, six, seven, sorry, two, six, seven, divided by my molar mass, which is 74. And that gives me 36.08 kilojoules per gram. That's looking better, so maybe that isn't too bad, actually. Now, ethine, again, going from kilojoules per mole to kilojoules per gram, divide by my molar mass. I'm gonna get, divide by 26, that's gonna give me 50 kilojoules per gram, and that answer is gonna be D, because any energy per gram is gonna be the same as energy per 100 gram. Question 23, based on the titration above, all right, so let's look at the information here. We've got citric acid was analyzed by titration. Citric acid is this. Notice the fact that we've got three carboxyl groups. 
Um, we're, anal we're titrating this against standard solution of sodium hydroxide. So we've got a three to one ratio. You can see the fact that we're gonna have three sodium hydroxides to every acid because it's a triprotic acid. So phenylphthalein indicator was used for the average titer. That's pretty good. Phenylphthalein indicator is a good indicator for use in a weak acid and a strong base situation. But anyway, let's move on. Based on the titration, the concentration of that in solution was what? So what do we know? We know the number of moles of NaOH, which is our standard solution, is going to be C times V, which is uh, 0 0.0. 0.025 times my volume, which is 0.024. So let's bang those numbers in here. 0.025 times 0.024 gives me 0.0006 mole. My ratio is three sodium hydroxides to every one acid. So I'm gonna divide by three to get my number of moles of acid. So therefore, that's going to be divided by 3, gives me 0 0.0002. My concentration of acid, therefore, which is what I think we need, yep, is going to be my N over V. So therefore, I'm going to take that, divide that by my aliquot, which is 0 0.025. So therefore, that divided by 0 0.025 gives me 0 0.008 molar. And what is that going to be? It is going to be... A. That's my answer for question 23. Simple titration. Main thing is we need to be able to work out my ratio and then go concentration um, times volume, ratio, um, number of moles divided by volume to get my concentration there. Alrighty. Question 24. Which of the following would have resulted in a concentration that is higher than the actual concentration? Okie dokie. So I want a higher concentration. What should be happening? Rinsing the pipette with NaOH. All right, what was in the pipette? In the pipette, there was an aliquot of this. If I put NaOH in it, it's going to react with it some already. So therefore, it's going to lower the concentration before it gets into my titer. That is not true. That's going to lower how much titer I actually use. Rinsing the pipette with that solution. That's a good thing. I want that to happen. I want my pipette to be rinsed with what goes in it, and my aliquot tells me what's in it, so therefore I want that to happen, so that's not going to be right either. Rinsing the conical flask with NaOH, that's going to do the same thing as rinsing the pipette with it, because if I put my um, aliquot in my conical flask, I add NaOH, less is needed, going to be needed from the burette, so therefore that's going to lower how much sodium hydroxide I add to it. If I rinse the conical flask with this, that is going to put more of my um, acid into my conical flask than I had in my pipette. So I'm going to need more sodium hydroxide from my burette. D is the correct answer here. So going through each one on a case-by-case -case basis and working out what effect would putting this in my pipette do. What effect would that being in my pipette do? Um, and the only correct rinsing here would be um, B. That's what we should be rinsing it with. Anyway, moving on to part, sorry, not part, sec question 25. Petrodiesel is made up of a number of different compounds, including this guy. Biodiesel often contains this guy, which in biodiesel is an ester functional group, and this guy here is just a plain hydrocarbon, which is great. When comparing these two, which of the following statements is correct? What have we got? We've got the fact that our petrodiesel has a higher viscosity. This is incorrect. Our biodiesel has a higher viscosity. Petrodiesel is less hygroscopic, which is correct, as it only has dispersion forces between molecules. That is also correct. So that's looking pretty good to me. Um, so therefore, dispersion forces mean we can't actually bond with water. So therefore, hydroscopity would be going down because hygroscopity is about it absorbing water from the surroundings and being really bad. Question C is this has a higher energy content. That is not true. Um, biodiesel has a lower energy content than petrodiesel, and that is because it contains oxygen atoms because it's already partially oxidized. So that's not true. Biodiesel would produce more carbon dioxide per mole when it combusts due to its higher molecular weight. Carbon dioxide per mole is about how many carbons there are in our molecule. This guy has 11 carbons, so it's going to form 11 CO2s. This guy here has 12, so it's going to form 12 CO2s. So therefore, that is not true because our petrodiesel is going to produce one extra carbon dioxide. So therefore, the answer here is B. 
So here we are at question 26 and we've got this um, redox reaction here. So the following re reactions occur in a primary cell battery. We've got this. Which of the following statements about the battery is correct? The reaction produces heat, uh, reacts directly. No, we've got a button battery, so it's not that. So therefore it does not react directly, that's good. Reacts directly, but it's not good. So therefore anything that says that the reactions happen directly is incorrect in a battery. It has to go through an external cell. The question here is, does the reaction produce heat or does it not produce heat? Now, um, we don't want it to produce heat. We want it to produce electricity, but we know it's not 100% efficient. So I think the best answer here is B, because we will produce heat as a byproduct. It's not 100% efficient, so therefore it's not all going to go into electrical energy. We're going to have some heat produced as well. It's not the main thing that happens in a battery, but you do have batteries that warm up over time as well. Let's move on to question 27. Question 27 is its information here. We've got the heat of combustion of ethanoic acid is this, the heat of combustion of methyl methanoid is this. Um, so what have we got? Which of the following pairs is correct? The compound with the lower chemical energy per mole is what? And the compound with the lower activation energy per mole is what? All right, activation energy, we've got some information about auto ignition temperatures, which is about activation energy. It's about how much energy needs to be put in before we actually do this. Um, now, activation energy for um, methyl methanoate is lower, so therefore the lower activation energy would be methyl methanoate. So we can cross out this one and this one. But the question is which one of these to have lower chemical energy? Now, chemical energy, you can look at it via a, um, what's it called, an energy profile diagram. Now you're gonna end up, when you combust things, you're gonna form H2O and H2, um, carbon dioxide regardless. So you're gonna end up with the same um, products there. But the question is, where do these guys lie? Which one is higher in energy here? Um, so we've got the difference between these two is gonna be um, 186. This one has a higher difference, so therefore that must mean it has more energy. So therefore, which one has a lower energy per mole? It must be the one which produces less energy, so therefore it's ethanoic acid, it has to be A. And I get that basically by trying to make up a basic idea of a um, energy profile diagram. And I can know that my products are gonna be the same, they're gonna be carbon dioxide and water regardless, so I'm gonna draw that in there. And then I'm gonna go up and work out where my reactants would be based on that. And the difference here, as I said, to the um, ethanoic acid is gonna be 876. And therefore the other one here is gonna be a bit higher. So that's the answer there based on the information presented. Question 28, if one mole of ethanoic acid, one mole of methyl methanoate were completely combusted in two separate enclosing under identical conditions, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of the product gases for the combustion of ethanoic acid would be what? Well, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. We've got um, basically producing two different amounts of energy, so therefore one of them is going to be higher in temperature. So therefore if I do that as one, we're going to end up with the higher temperature being a bit more spread out there. So this is going to be T2, this is going to be T1. Which one is the higher temperature? The methyl methanoate is going to get a higher temperature. So this or this is going to be methyl methanoate is going to be this guy. And therefore this guy here is going to be the ethanoic acid. So which is going to be broader? The Maxwell, the ethanoic acid is going to be thinner, narrower than my methyl methanoate because it's at a lower temperature. So I can take out the broader. So my Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is going to be narrower because my ethanoic acid is at a lower temperature than my methyl methanoate. What's the other part of this? Um, the product gases um, and the chemical energy of the product gases will be identical or the chemical energy would be higher. All right, I already said before that my chemical energy of my product gases are the same because they're both carbon dioxide and H2O. So therefore, it's gonna be B. We have a narrower Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution because we have a lower temperature produced. However, the um, energy of the gases would be identical. I think that's pretty 
good on that one. Let's move on to question 29. Which of the following combinations of bonds would be broken during the breakdown of a protein? All right, a protein. We are breaking down a protein. We've got covalent bonds in the secondary structure. That's incorrect. There are no covalent bonds in the secondary structure. These to do with hydrogen bonds. So therefore we can cross out that. Covalent bonds in the tertiary structure. Uh, not ones we normally talk about, but we do have disulfide bonds in the tertiary structure. Hydrogen bonds in the secondary structure, that's looking relatively okay. We don't normally talk about tertiary bonds with covalent things. Covalent bonds are normally the primary structure, but we'll move on. Covalent bonds in the secondary structure. Here, cross that one out. That's, that's not true. Covalent bonds in the quaternary structure. That could happen because of disulfide linkages. But hydrogen bonds in the primary structure is not true. Covalent bonds in the primary structure, it must be B. That's our answer to question 29. Looking, looking at the different types of bonds in the various structures of proteins.